Today on Would You Believe It? Discover the truth behind the first settlers of North America and see the astronomical calendar they left behind, still accurate after 4,000 years. Hear the strange tale of the original Ebenezer Scrooge, whose miserly scheming led to an early death. Learn the tragic history behind William Mulholland's ill-fated St. Francis Dam and see the aftermath of its horrifying failure. We'll visit the strange, the bizarre, and the unexpected on Would You Believe It? Stonehenge. Since the dawn of history, its mysterious looming rocks have cast their spell over awestruck visitors. Journey further west into the mist-shrouded land of Cornwall, and ancient stones can be found around every corner. It is impossible to gaze up at these awe-inspiring constructions without wondering what strange rituals were once performed here. This story is about one such site, currently being studied by eminent scientists and believed by some to be one of the most important finds in the world. It is thought to have been built by the same culture that built Stonehenge, Yet to find the site in question, you have to journey further west, much further, beyond the ocean that until 1492 was believed to have been uncrossable. This is America's Stonehenge. I believe America's Stonehenge is one of the most important sites in uh, North America. America's Stonehenge also known as Mystery Hill. Deep in the woods of New England, near the small town of North Salem, New Hampshire, this eerie collection of megaliths and archeological remains has scientists perplexed. Dr. Lewis Winkler is conducting new research with far-reaching conclusions. Mystery Hill is a unique archeoastronomy site in America. It is the first and perhaps only precision observatory uh, it is evidence of not only pre-Columbian settlements here, but a highly developed society that had to uh, be using this uh, site. Dr. Winkler is working with site owners, continuing a study that has been ongoing since archaeologists first examined these stones in the 1930s. The first person to recognize the importance of the site was insurance millionaire William Goodwin. Goodwin bought 20 acres of land and started the first archaeological excavations. His studies convinced him that these ruins were the remains of a settlement of Irish monks who had fled religious persecution and crossed the Atlantic over a thousand years ago. I think as we look at America's Stonehenge and we look at the structures that are there and we look at the similarities between what is here in North Salem and what we find in Europe, the similarities are too great. I don't believe there's a possibility of a civilization developing here separately from the one in Europe. Incredible as Goodwin's theory was, the truth turned out to be far stranger. Columbus rediscovered America, and we didn't lose track of it after that. In 1969, an excavation by present owner Robert Stone revealed charcoal and stone tools. The charcoal was carbon dated at 4,000 years old, dating the tools and settlement at around 2,000 BC. Really what we have are evidence of people having come from Europe uh, to uh, this particular area of North America, probably at this very similar time in actuality that uh, structures like this were being constructed in Europe. One or more megalithic builders from the British Isles in the Bronze Age uh, migrated here to establish the, uh, the site. This discovery dispelled another theory about the site, that it was built by colonial farmers. According to local historical records, Mr. Patti lived here on the site between 1826 and 1855, clearing many of the stone walls to build his house. At this turbulent time in America's history, Patti was an abolitionist and his home in the woods was a waypoint on the Underground Railroad, used to help escaping slaves flee north to the safety of Canada. This four-and-a-half-ton slab was originally thought to have been used by Patti as a cider press, until comparison with similar sites in Europe revealed its far more sinister purpose. These grooves were not made to funnel apple juice, but blood. This is a sacrificial table. Standing on four stone legs, this centerpiece to the site holds an eerie fascination for visitors. Who knows what animal or human victims met their doom on this cold stone slab? 
This area is known as the holding pen. Animals awaiting ritual slaughter would be held here until their time had come. Underneath the sacrificial table is a mysterious opening, which leads to a small tunnel, which in turn opens out into this, an underground room. It is known as the Oracle Chamber, after the most popular theory surrounding its use. At the designated time of year, a ceremony would be held involving sacrificial offerings to the gods, asking their predictions for the coming year. Meanwhile, the holy man was hidden in here, speaking into this tunnel, his voice amplified in the area around the table, and the villagers' questions were answered. The outlying areas of Mystery Hill are littered with ancient walls and megaliths. The primary reason for Mystery Hill's many standing stones, according to Professor Winkler, is that it was designed as a calendar. The most telltale feature of the site that relates it to uh, precision astronomy is the mid-year alignment to the west where you have four collinear stones. And this is similar to uh, almost a dozen sites in the British Isles which were built in the Bronze Age, 1500 BC to 2000 BC, which uh, forms the basis for uh, reckoning time used in calendars. Measurements taken by laser theodolite show that this line of megaliths accurately marks out the mid-year axis to within one-tenth of a degree. This is the same degree of accuracy that the Egyptians achieved when aligning the pyramids. Whoever built America's Stonehenge certainly knew what they were doing. Only master craftsmen could have fashioned these edges with such exactness. These rocks here were left in situ, halfway through the quarrying process. An ancient earthquake fault provided one edge, and the other was shaped by a smaller rock. Professor Winkler's work continues, but the secrets of the ancient people who lived here may never be discovered. Perhaps the only way to really understand this mysterious site is to gather here and watch the sunset on the fall equinox. After more than 4,000 years, this ancient calendar seems to be working just fine. They say money can't buy you happiness. Take, for example, the story of John Overy, who lived here on the banks of London's River Thames in the 17th century. John was the original Scrooge. He hated spending money, and he had a lot of money. Before London's great bridges were built, he bought miles of land along the South Bank, so tradesmen from the South had to use his ferry to get to the north. Here across the river from the city, this monument marks the site of his house from where he ran his successful monopoly. Business boomed, but for John, pictured in this etching, earning money was only half his obsession because John was London's most notorious miser. His house, which stood where Sir Francis Drake's ship, the Golden Hind, now resides, was kept bare and cold. He dressed in his only threadbare suit and never bathed, saying it was a waste of good soap. The one luxury he afforded himself was employing two servants, but rather than paying them money, they worked for food. The tight-fisted old man would feed them decomposing scraps of meat washed up by the river and moldy bread so they would eat less and save him more. But his servants were still costing him money. One wintry evening, the old miser devised an extraordinary penny-pinching plan. Custom had it, when a master died, the servants of the household would fast for a week in mourning. John decided all he had to do to save a whole week's grocery bill was convince his servants he was dead. Chuckling to himself at the simplicity of his plan, he wasted no time in lying on a table and covering himself with a bedsheet. When his servants arrived to find John deathly still and laid out, they both assumed the stingy old fiend had finally expired. Quietly, they left the room. Moments later, they returned, carrying as much food and drink from the pantry as they could. To John's horror, far from having a fast, they were having a feast, celebrating their master's demise, drinking, laughing, and singing right in front of him. He sat bolt upright to chide his disrespectful staff. The servants screamed in terror as the sheet rose up, as if the very spirit of their deceased master had returned. Stumbling from the evil specter, one of the servants grabbed an oar and beat the spirit over the head. Despite her fear, the other servant joined in this crude exorcism with a wooden tray. John's ruse had failed. Saving a week's food bill had cost him his life. Satisfied the phantom had vacated their master's corpse, the breathless servants decided they should bury him as soon as possible, so sent word to his family. 
all over England. The 12 children who had always squabbled over money couldn't believe their luck. Finally, they would get their hands on their legacy, but they would have to be quick. With no executor, it would be first come, first served. When the messenger arrived here, at the house of his eldest daughter, Mary, a hundred miles from London, she immediately dispatched her husband to fight for whatever he could get. Pushing past the messenger, he grabbed up a few belongings, rushed out of the front door, and leapt onto his horse. He was in such a hurry, he leapt clean over the saddle and fell off on the other side, crashing down on the cobbles, head first. The messenger returned to London with more sad news. Mary's husband was dead. The overwrought daughter arrived soon after. So disgusted by what money had done to her family, she vowed to rid the Overy family of all her father's wealth. She took charge of the inheritance, then spent every penny of it on this church. She donated her money to the quiet nuns of Southwark, who built it and named it the Church of St. Mary Overy in her honor. Money had torn her family apart, resulted in the beating death of her miserly father and the accidental death of her husband. They say money can't buy you happiness. After two such unhappy endings, you can only agree. Would you believe it? There is a city in America that could not exist without dams. Los Angeles, California. At the beginning of the century, Los Angeles was a desert town, already exhausting its water resources. One man had the answer to its problem. William Mulholland, self-trained engineer and head of the LA Bureau of Water Works and Supply. While surveying potential water sources in the mountains east of the city, Mulholland developed one of the most radical feats of civil engineering in the world. He proposed bringing water from the Owens Valley, over 330 miles northeast of Los Angeles. Crossing steep inclines, the Los Angeles Aqueduct would use no pumps relying on cutting-edge siphon technology to raise water up over the dominating mountain ranges. After passing through the Elizabeth Tunnel, the water emerges here, power plant number one in the San Francisco Canyon north of Los Angeles. Electricity generated here paid for the cost of the whole project within the first few years of operation. The Los Angeles aqueduct was pronounced an engineering marvel and Mulholland was proclaimed a hero. However, he remained true to his first love, engineering. When asked if he would run for mayor, he replied, I'd rather give birth to a porcupine backwards. One more piece of the project remained, a storage facility. This is Hollywood Lake, held back by a dam named after Mulholland. This still wasn't enough to satisfy the water needs of this drought-afflicted city, which was now the fastest growing metropolis in America. Mulholland had somewhere in mind for a new reservoir, a reservoir big enough to supply the city for a year. San Francisco Canyon, home of power plant number one. Mulholland knew of a place where the canyon narrowed. He had already performed exploratory tests to see if the hillsides could support a dam, and the results were encouraging. Construction started in 1922 on the St. Francis Dam. Objections came from local farmers who relied on San Francisco Creek. Without a regular flowing stream, their water table would become depleted and their livelihood would disappear. The farmers were ignored. And St. Francis Dam was completed in 1926. Worries that the dam was unsafe because it had several leaks were dismissed by Mulholland, who explained that all dams leak. Despite the confidence of its chief engineer, however, the dam had flaws in its design, location, and construction. Professor David Rogers has made a detailed study of the St. Francis Dam. The early dam structures were built out of earth. In the early 1800s, however, the secret of cement, which had been lost with the Romans, was rediscovered during the building of the Erie Canal in upstate New York. And concrete suddenly became the preferred material. It offered a lot of advantages. Number one was strength. Two was great density a minimal amount of material to create the dead weight necessary to hold back a large body of water. This particular dam was built by the Bureau of Water Works and Supply of the City of Los Angeles to retain water in, from the Owens River Aqueduct. The concrete was not of the greatest strength compared to concrete of today. When they were building the dam, they had insufficient water 
to clean the aggregate. This caused the concrete to have a low tensile strength, which figures prominently in the genesis of the failure. Even as the dam was being built, dual factors of drought and population increase made it clear to Mulholland that more water storage capacity was needed. He came up with a solution that was to have unforeseen consequences. One of the Achilles heels in St. Francis were design decisions that were made to heighten the dam on two occasions. The dam was originally intended to be 185 feet high at its maximum position, but this was raised twice during construction, once in to 195 feet and then another 10 feet to a height of 205. We can see the vestiges of that decision right here on the wing dike where we have a finished surface here and then we see another finished surface which was the final crest of the dam up here five feet higher. With a greater volume and more importantly a greater depth of water behind it the dam was increasingly vulnerable to hydraulic uplift a principle that was not commonly understood by engineers at the time. The pressure of such a depth of water actually acted to push up the dam which was simply a plug of concrete. The deeper the water, the less relative weight the dam had. The third major problem identified by Dr. Rogers was the dam's location. We're here at the main St. Francis Dam site where San Francisco Canyon has its narrowest point. This is where dam engineers like to build dams because you have the minimum volume of material necessary to create the structure. The reason for this natural pinching, however, is a paleo landslide or ancient bedrock landslide that fell off this mountain here and into the canyon and pinched it closed. That's why it was such a good dam site. As suggested by the terracing of this mountainside, the left abutment of the dam was built against ground that had been formed in an ancient landslide. Engineers knew that it was formed of volatile Polona schist, but they didn't realize just how fragile this mountainside was. At about 10.30 on March 12, 1928, dam keeper Tony Harnesbegger made a call down to William Mulholland concerned about cracks and leaks coming from the west abutment of the dam. Mulholland, along with his uh, chief superintendent, Harvey Van Norman, came out to the dam about an hour later, did a cursory inspection on the face of the dam. Dam keeper Tony Harnesbegger was worried because muddy water from a leak could indicate hydraulic piping. As shown in this photo taken that day, Mulholland inspected the dam but found no evidence of hydraulic piping. Jumping ahead about to uh, 6 o'clock that evening, a family by the name of Riley from Piru were coming back from Antelope Valley. Well, Bill, the father, walked out onto the dam and immediately told the girls and his wife to turn around and go back in the car. His wife, Abigail, said, what's the problem? Look at the leaks down here. I mean, this dam is not safe. Abigail says, ah, oh, they wouldn't build a dam here and have so many people living near the dam. You know, they wouldn't do that. And he said, well, just the same. If the lights go out tonight in Piru, you know that the dam has failed. Mulholland's dam would not last out the night. At 11.57, technicians at power plant number one noted a loss of power somewhere in the system. The power plant below the dam had gone offline. This is the original logbook from the power plant that night. It tells the story of what happened in chilling simplicity. The dam has gone out. The lake is dry. The liability posed by this ancient landslide was as the lake started to fill with water, hydraulic pressure developed in that abutment, in that loose material, and lifted up underneath the left side of the dam. That caused a catastrophic failure near midnight on Monday, March 12, 1928 releasing 36,000 acre feet of water in under an hour. Initial wall of water 140 feet deep, moving about 25 miles an hour down this narrow canyon. This wall of water swept down the canyon, scouring the hillsides and carrying huge blocks of concrete many hundreds of yards. In the turbid water, thick with eroded soil, segments of the dam floated like corks. The first victims were dam keeper Tony Harnischweger and his family. Their bodies were never found. Further down the canyon was power plant number two. Here, 35 families lived in a small village. This photo was taken days before the disaster. 
none of these people survived. By the time the water had passed through here, the steep slopes were stripped bare. These pictures show the scour mark 120 feet high on the canyon walls. Out of a community of more than 100, all but one died. Downstream, about another hour from this point, the lights went out in Piru, and uh, Bill Riley's uh, prophecy had come true. The Santa Clara River Valley runs 54 miles from Santa Clarita, just south of the dam site, to Ventura on the Pacific Ocean. Along this peaceful valley, anything in the way of the rampaging water was doomed. 50 miles from the dam site, the residents of Santa Paula slept, unaware of the horror that was already bearing down on them. When news reached the Santa Paula Telephone Exchange, there was little time left. Instead of running for high ground, operator Louise Geip stayed at her post. She knew that every person she could warn would be a life saved. As the minutes ticked by, other telephone operators rushed to work. Ignoring their own peril, they frantically warned people in the valley. Two motorcycle policemen, one of them this man, John Messer, combed the streets, desperately telling people to evacuate, pushing their motorcycles to the limit, playing a deadly game of cat and mouse with the onrushing wave. These policemen were the flood's advance guard. Above the town of Santa Paula, the raging water slammed into this bridge. For a moment, it held, damming up a tide of water that was so swollen with so much debris, it was more solid than liquid. Then, with a screech of torn metal, the bridge gave way. Few buildings escaped. Those that did were buried in mud and debris. This school withstood the force of the flood, but the surrounding houses were not so lucky. Word reached Mulholland at 2.15 that morning. His daughter hurriedly laid out his work clothes, but he chose to dress in black. His first words were, please, God, don't let people be killed. His prayer would not be answered. In the Santa Clara Valley, dawn revealed the full extent of the destruction. For many, the only task at hand was searching for loved ones. Hundreds of swollen corpses were carried out. Many were naked, their clothes torn from their bodies by the force of the flood. The number of victims was counted. Whole families were gone. First estimates of casualties were soon outstripped as body after body was pulled from the mud. Most were unidentifiable. This list from Santa Paula shows the dead by whatever description was possible. Makeshift morgues were set up in tents. As the number of victims began to mount, shock turned to anger. For many, it felt as though the towns along the valley had been victims of a terrible crime and someone had to pay. Mulholland was a broken man. He said of the disaster, if any man is to blame, then I am that man. The final death toll was over 400. It was a time for reflection, a time to learn from the mistakes made in the dam's construction and design, so that something this terrible would never happen again. But as the funerals took place in the valley, Mulholland had a new problem. The Hollywood Reservoir, looking over Los Angeles, was held back by exactly the same type of dam. Hollywood Reservoir was a source of great worry to the residents of Hollywood and all the film studios down below in 1928 after St. Francis failed. After all, it was a virtual copy of the St. Francis Dam. Bill Mulholland wisely chose to immediately order Hollywood Reservoir drawn down to half of its level as a precaution until they unraveled the failure of St. Francis Dam. This turned out to be a wise move, for it was determined that this reservoir had the same design deficiencies, and 240,000 cubic yards of earth fill was placed against the downstream face of the dam to bolster the mass of the dam itself, creating one of the most conservative water retention structures in the United States. Although now stronger than its failed twin, millions live beneath it betting their lives that this dam will survive the big one. Would you believe it?